I come from Sri Lanka, a small island, the tail end of India. My country can give two things to the world. One is the message of the Buddha. And the other one is a very sweet thing, Ceylon tea. I am not here to advertise tea, but to speak a few things about the Buddha and his teaching. So the title for this talk is Understanding the Buddha. I use the definite article the because the word Buddha is not a name but a title like Christ, which means the enlightened one or the awakened one, awakened from the slumber of ignorance. From the Buddha's point of view, ignorance is the worst taint or defilement it is the crowning corruption of all our madness. So, awakened means awakened from the slumber of ignorance. The Buddha came into this world as Bodhisattva. This word we must keep in mind. That's how he was known before he became the Buddha. Bodhisattva. Bodhi means enlightenment. Sapta means adhering to or bent on or aiming at. Aiming at enlightenment. Bent on enlightenment. That's how he was known before he became the Buddha. The Bodhisattva was born 6th century before Christ. That's 2000. 500 and more years ago. One may think, well, 2,500 years ago must have been a very backward period, a backward era. Far from it. History tells us that this century, 6th century before Christ, was remarkable for its social and spiritual ferment in many parts of the country. There was great activity, social and religious, going on. In Rome, the last of the kings had come and gone. In Greece, the tyrants were replaced by a more democratic form of government. And then you come to India, there was Siddhartha Gautama the Buddha and Jaina Mahavira. Come to Persia, a modern Iran, there was Zarathustra, or as the Greeks named him Zoroaster, with his teaching. Come to China, there was Lao Tse, who had kindled men's mind with his teaching. And there was Confucius, middle of the 6th century. He established a code of ethics based on the customs and traditions of China. So you see that 6th century before Christ was the peak period or the golden era where religions are concerned. Now, when you speak about Buddhism, a noteworthy characteristic that distinguishes the Buddha from all other religious teachers is that he was a human being, not a god, not a Brahma, not an incarnation of God, not a mythological figure, a human being, a man, but not just another man or another philosopher. He was a man among men. He was a unique being and man par excellence. He became an extraordinary man because, not because he had a peculiar constitution or body. His body too was made up of blood and flesh and bones. But you know, sisters and brothers, we all have 
a thing called a mind or consciousness. We can train and cultivate this thing called mind. The Bodhisattva did this, not one birth, two or hundred, many, many births. He cultivated the mind and he cultivated and practiced ten essential qualities of high standard. They are known as the paramita, the perfection. Charitable giving, morality, renunciation, wisdom, effort, forbearance or patience, determination, truthfulness, love and equanimity. These are the ten essential qualities of high standard which a bodhisattva cultivates or practice to attain enlightenment. Now, when we say the Buddha was a human being, he had human parents, he had a wife, he, his father was a king ruling a certain section part of North India and uh, he was married to another princess, Yasodhara, and he had a child, Rahula. The king was doing his best to keep the son tied to the world because the king Sudhodana's father wanted his son to succeed him. But the Bodhisattva's mission was different. He was in the palace, not very happy. As he advanced in age, he glimpsed the woes of the world and he was thinking of a way how to get away from these tangles, suffering, pain, anguish, Yasodhara, his wife, the princess, knew that the Bodhisattva loved her. Oh, the Bodhisattva prince loves me, but he loves something else which I do not know. And his thought runs to that thing he loves like a dove flies home. The Bodhisattva was all the time thinking of the way of getting away from this tangle to get at enlightenment and truth. And now the Bodhisattva, the Siddhartha Gautama, his personal name was Siddhartha and his family name was Gautama. He found it difficult to leave the palace. He didn't care for the crown. He gave up that crown which held the promise of power and glory. But the most difficult thing for him was to leave behind his wife and child. But he made up his mind. He was with firm determination. He thought to himself, it's really a barrier, but I must go. Otherwise, I can't attain enlightenment and find out a way to get away from this tangle. If I go and get at enlightenment, I can be of help to mankind, bring peace and happiness and freedom to mankind, including my wife and child. With great difficulty, he tore himself away and went into sylvan solitude as an indigent ascetic. This is the greatest adventure for me. This is the greatest adventure to give up all that discarding and disdaining the enchantment of royal life, royal life. He went away and he lived the life of an ascetic. He went to all the meditation masters of the day and he studied under them all types of yoga. That's why after he became Buddha, he was able to tackle all these yogic problems with those who came to see him. And then he found out what they had to teach him was not sufficient. Their range of knowledge, their ambit of mystical experience was insufficient. And the Bodhisattva was not satisfied short of anything short of enlightenment. So the Bodhisattva bade goodbye to those masters 
and went his own way searching for a new path. He also practiced for six long years with five other self-mortification or self-torture. Because there is a belief in India, even today, the belief is that if you practice self-torture, you can get at enlightenment and freedom. So the Bodhisattva did it for six long years, adding vigil on vigil, penance on penance, and he really came to death's very door. And he realized now, experience, not hearsay, experience that this is not the way to enlightenment. He gave up one extreme, that is, the life he led in the palace, gave up that extreme and went into another extreme, self-torture, self-mortification. Now he gave up that extreme too. He went to a tree, now called the Bodhi tree, there is no such tree called Bodhi, that's the of, of the tree belonged to the fig family. He went to this tree and looked round and he saw the forest one vivid green and he thought to himself, is he really soothing to my senses and stimulating to my mind? And there is a river from where I can get my water and there is a village where I can go for my arms. So the Bodhisattva, sisters and brothers, sat down under that big tree, under the shade of that tree with that firm determination, let my blood and flesh wither away, let my skin and bones remain, I shall not, I will not stir from this seat until I have attained full enlightenment. He was so flagging in his, unflagging in his devotion, so unflinching in his energy, with steel determination, he sat down. And on a full moon day of the flowering month of May, which we call Vesak, the Bodhisattva attained full enlightenment by comprehending in all their fullness the four noble truths. These noble truths, four truths, namely that there is suffering, pain, anguish in the world. If you don't like the word suffering, let us call it conflicts. Let us say unsatisfactoriness or problems, we can't deny this. There are problems, conflicts. Now, these conflicts are not without causes. They have their causes. They have their conditions. So, problems or conflicts, they are causes getting away from these conflicts and the way to do it. Now, sisters and brothers, I will have to deal with these four truths in detail in another talk. But enlightenment means understanding these truths. Suffering or anguish or conflicts, they are causes the cessation of this conflict and the way to get away from the conflict. These are the four truths. This is the essence and the quintessence of the Buddha's teaching. Understanding ourselves is very important. The most difficult thing to do is to understand ourselves. When two persons come together, really, there are six persons, although that sounds rather paradoxical. How do you get six out of the two? Each person, as he sees himself, or each person, as she sees herself. One. Each person, as the other person sees him, or as the other person sees herself. Number two. Number three is each person as she really is or he really is. To get at that really as he really is, to understand the real person is very difficult. 
I think I am so and so, I am so and so, depending on the so-called ego or ego, I am so and so, who is that man? That is his concept of himself. And the other man says he is so and so. Now, there is the real man behind all these concepts. We have to make a distinction between concepts and realities. When I sit down like this, I am Piyadasi. Now that is a concept really. Behind Piyadasi, there is a body and a mind. And understand what is body and what is mind. These are subjects we will deal with in other talks. So, to understand ourselves, the real man, and drop concepts. Concepts and realities do not coexist. They do not coexist. They are two different things. So when you understand ourselves, we drop all the concepts and get at reality. Now the Buddha, having attained enlightenment, he did not rest satisfied. Without resting on his laurels, he went to meet the people. He knew that he must give this message. He also later had a number of disciples and gave them a mandate. This is what you should do. Take this message and warn the fourth monks for the welfare, for the weal and happiness of mankind or gods and mankind. Give this message. Excellent in the beginning, excellent in the middle and excellent in the end. I too will walk giving this message to all. From my point of view, I think the Buddha was the greatest walker in the world. Later, Mahatma Gandhi and Vinoba Bhave of India, following in the footsteps of the Master, walked from village to village, suburb to suburb, to speak to people. They did not use cars and other vehicles. They found that was the more effective way of meeting people. So the Buddha walked and walked the highways and byways of India, enfolding all within the aura of his love, compassion and understanding. He met all types of people from different walks of life. He met princes and paupers, the literate and the illiterate the rich and the poor, the saints and the criminals, women and children. And he spoke to them, encouraged them, gladdened them. Whenever he detected their frailties, their weaknesses, their shortcomings, the Buddha never said, you are a sinner, you are a wretched sinner. No. He said, monks, this is due to ignorance. We must teach them. Take them out of darkness. You are all enveloped in darkness. Won't you come out of this darkness? That is how the Buddha encouraged people. I must say the Buddha was a revolutionary in the eminent sense of the word. When I say revolutionary, people think of only politics. A revolution, like the French Revolution and so on. The political revolution. No. Revolution means to bring about a radical change in any field. So the Buddha, I say, was a revolutionary uh, because he went against uh, certain useless things that were in existence during the time of the Buddha. He went against the debasing caste system that divided people and not united people that divided people, the caste system. Then he found that the people were offering sacrifices, making sacrifices, killing animals and offering their blood to their gods for deliverance and freedom and peace and happiness. And the Buddha said, look, why do you kill these innocent animals? You have so many animals in yourself within, in your world within. Your hatred, your greed, your conceit, your ignorance, these are the 
animals you must kill and get rid of. So go ahead, kill the animals. Don't kill these innocent animals. They are our sisters and brothers in a way. And then women were held in contempt, but the Buddha treated them very kindly and with civility and raised them from lower to higher levels of mental life and even for the first time in the world established an order of nuns. Now, sisters and brothers, another thing he did was working human rights. You must have the freedom of thought, freedom of speech. In his teaching, the absolute freedom. He says, examine my teaching. Don't believe it merely because it's in the books. Or the preacher is a good one. Or it is there for a long time. No. Or because uh, this teaching is my teaching. No. Like a man who wants to test the purity of gold, breaks it, applies to a touchstone or put in the fire in order to find out whether it is a good gold, pure gold. Like that you must examine and scrutinize and my teaching. Don't believe it. Belief is a poor word, sisters and brothers. Most important thing in the Buddha's teaching is understanding. You must try to understand and belief is just poor word understand, scrutinize my teaching. The Buddha was the analytical philosopher and is teaching a doctrine of analysis. An analytical philosopher does not state things unitarily, that is taking things in a lump, but always is analyzed and scrutinized each and right down to their ultimate, into their fundamental elements. So the Buddha advises his disciples to not to be skimmers or surface seers, but to delve deep and see what is beyond the naked eye. In Buddhism, there is the emotional and the intellectual. In other words, both head and heart. The Buddha does not praise the good-hearted fool. He's a good-hearted man, but a fool. Also, the Buddha does not praise the hard-hearted hard, hard intellect. He's very brainy, he knows lots of things, but he's hard-hearted. The Buddha wants us to cultivate the qualities of the heart too, not only the brain, not only your knowledge and your intellectual things. When we speak about the qualities of the heart, there are four things which are known as the four sublime states. I would call it the art of noble living, that is cultivating uh, love, compassion, sympathetic joy and equanimity. These are four qualities of the heart. So we must see that we don't overdo the emotional aspect, but must keep the balance, uh, both emotional and intellectual. Buddhism is for all mankind. It's not a thing that's only for India or Sri Lanka or for Southeast Asia. It's for all people, never mind, doesn't matter what language you speak, what food you eat, what clothes you wear and what country you call your um, what country you call your home for the Buddha it is the language of the heart language of truth and therefore we must understand that Buddhism is really we can reduce it to wisdom and uh, compassion if you ask who is the Buddha embodiment of uh, Harm, I mean embodiment of compassion and wisdom. And if you ask what is Buddhism, without speaking much about it, in few words it is compassion and wisdom. So we see that it is a religion 
also a philosophy that doesn't mean just mere love of wisdom, but we have to apply the philosophy to life. Thank you, sisters and brothers. May your upward path be smooth, sure and steady.